Nailing the perfect marriage of story to gameplay is a science that many developers still struggle with today. Bioshock has left an indelible mark on gaming narrative that can be seen and felt in many modern releases, but Irrational's motto remained from the beginning, don't start with the story, start with the gameplay. A lot of fans probably wonder about the process you go through in writing the story and the design for a game like Bioshock. You've talked about how you know it evolved over time and what eventually shifts is very different than your initial vision. Do you guys write like a script or a design document for the game and that becomes sort of the Bible that everyone drives towards or, or do you iterate much more? It's different for every game. Like System Shock 2, I wrote I, you know, I went back to it recently. I wrote a design document and like we started that project in September and the design document I saw was dated like October or something. So like in a month, like I wrote the design document and it, it didn't change. A lot of it, you know, got expanded upon, but the basic design really didn't change on that. Where on, where on Bioshock, I think it evolved in real time much more. Like the, we had a pretty substantial design shift like a year before the ship date. For Bioshock? Um, Bioshock, yeah. It, it got to be much more about the experience of being in Rapture than about being in your character sheet. And so the game evolved more towards that experiential kind of thing and making sure every idea was expressed in the world as well as just on your character sheet. So before you'd have a lot of things like, oh, I'm doing fire damage or electrical damage, but that was sort of a number flying off ahead versus, you know, the whole notion of like, you know, uh, you there's barrels and you light them on fire and then you can pick them up and throw them. But you'd have stats coming off characters and all that. Yeah, much more so. Oh really? Huh. And that evolved, you know, sort of we did a design shift, but I don't know how well that got documented. I think we were moving so fast that it just we were just sort of changing things, you know, you know, laying down the laying down the tracks as we went right ahead of us. And the same with the screenplay, you know, the screenplay. The screenplay say there is no screenplay. It's a bunch of you know, probably Excel files and fragments of Word documents that I'd write and I'd go to recording sessions and I'd rewrite on the fly once I hear the actor perform. Because once the actor takes on it, you listen to their voice and you say, you know, what you wrote doesn't really matter. Like, what is this guy's, what is the right thing for this actor playing this role to be saying? So I tend to do a lot of rewriting in the session. And then like you have a bug late at night where somebody says, oh, this doesn't make any sense. And you're like, oh God, and you have to write a new audio log and try to get the actor back in. Or you figure out, how do, what's the best way to get this idea across? Yeah. And is it an audio log? Is it a poster on the wall? Is, yeah. it, is it a piece of text that pops up on the screen? You know, and that's always dependent on how much time you have and what actor availability is. So, you know, the plans sort of fall apart. Um, I think we've, we've worked on that a bunch since on the new project we're working on where, you know, we're, we're trying to document things a lot better and, and keep things a lot more logical. But the train was running so fast on Bioshock that we just sort of... I mean, early on, we got the, the Andrew Ryan scene in, like we'd said before. And that was kind of like the keystone. Like, we're going to put a lot of work into this, so this can't change. Everything that happens before or after that don't really involve a lot of departments working together to make a scene, those things are very malleable. And if you need to change audio logs to represent a story, if you need to add lines or take away lines, it's that's very doable, and I think for a while we even had like text to speech. We even did that in I remember for Infinite with Booker and Elizabeth and other dialogue, yeah. and that really didn't work very well because right. you'd have these dramatic scenes, and it'd be like Elizabeth, do you need? Do we need to go to Comstock? And it, it just yeah, just it, 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 was, it almost had no apart, value yeah, as yeah. far as I was concerned. <laughs> Atlas Radio on ahead. Says you were you're looking for an invite to the fisheries. Nuts, I say. But if in your head's up to the Warp Master's office and find old Peach a research camera, maybe I could manage an invite. Ken has so much of, you know, these games in his head, and you're sort of, you know, you can keep it all straight or try to with all the different things and changes. But from the team perspective, Sean, I mean, how. Because this is evolving and Ken's thinking his head about how this all ties together, um, how does the team sort of keep up with, you know, what the whole game's gonna look like? There's a lot of specifics that can change. For instance, um, Atlas used to have a southern drawl. Right. And then, you know, we, we recast to, uh, the Irish. And we, we, we actually, we actually cast an actor, wrote the lines. Uh -huh did the whole thing and realized that people hated that character and distrusted him from the first start. So we had to rewrite him, recast him, redo everything. Yeah. From a team perspective, 
you kind of get a sense on which things are going to be really volatile and that you probably want to push off till later because if you work on it now, it might change. Larger themes don't tend to change too much, meaning we knew we were in Rapture, we knew we had big daddies, we knew we had little sisters, we knew we had splicers, we knew what the arc of the story was about Jack coming into Rapture and the, the specifics of this radio log versus that radio log didn't really affect anyone outside the, the audio team at that time because we could still build the environment. We still knew what the environment was. We still knew what the animations were. There are areas you learn just by working in the same space for a while that this this scene, I'm not touching this yet because I know that it, it's, it's going to get changed a lot. I think these themes are pretty nailed down, so I'm going to focus the team on, on getting these things done. I won't leave you twisting in the wind. We're going to need to draw her out of height. The audio logs were, you know, a great part of the game and something that if you're a true fan, I mean, people really go in, go in and listen to those and piece that all together. But I imagine there's a lot of work that goes into deciding, you know, well, this this is better for an audio log versus game dialogue. And, you know, there's the act of sort of cutting back and sort of saying, you know, we need to be clear about what the narrative is for the game. What was that process like? I mean, the audio logs, were there things you added at the end or were those, you know, ideas that you had for the game, but then said, hey, maybe we'd demote these a little bit and make them audio logs? As Sean was saying, there's sort of a hierarchy of expense that yeah. you, you have to face, and so any ideas you have to get across, especially as you start playing the game, you realize, well, this doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense. You have to figure out how you can introduce that idea. And generally, as the train is moving, you try to think of cheaper and cheaper ways to get those ideas across. It's less important, it goes to an audio log. If it's less important, it goes to a poster on the wall. Um, well, there's also characters that you can bring in that have audio logs that aren't, you know, Atlas, Tenenbaum, those are your big ones. Uh, you can bring in somebody to do a short, you know, a few different audio logs. It's a character that some players may not even find, but right. it adds a little bit of depth to, to Rapture. Um, and, and, and it also, like, usually characters, each character generally is a about a certain idea. And they're not, we don't just sort of come up with characters, like we have an idea problem that we right. need to solve. And so let's introduce a character who, who's this guy, yeah. and he will be the guy who sort of shepherds you through that, uh, that idea. Julie, my dear, I am trying to run a business here. You want to spend time with my honeybees? Well, I'm going to have to start charging you for the pleasure. If I come out one more time and find you lolling out there amongst my hives, I'm grabbing my shotgun. As to your question, yes, my days in beekeeping school are a blur. But I do seem to remember something about that enzyme you keep blabbing on about. So as you're going through the game and, you know, writing things, rewriting things, were there things with the original Bioshock that you, you've you always been surprised that more people didn't pick up on? Or was there something that, you know, a, a connection to a character you thought was really going to resonate with people, which, you know, didn't? Anything like that? No, it's the opposite. Yeah. Um, I was amazed. I don't know how you felt, but I was amazed how many people connected to the Would You Kindly yeah. stuff. Like, yeah. Because I think it was a real, when I wrote that speech, I don't think anybody on the team was like, oh my God, this is like really this or that. And I don't think I really had any sense that people were going to connect to it. I think we ended up sort of over time finding more ways to support the notion throughout the game. Yep. Um, and I don't think I really, th until I heard Pat put together the, the, the revelation moment, you know, yeah. where, where it's like, you know, where you had all the bits that Atlas had said to you uh -huh. in the past building up and then there was a visual that went along with that. That's when I realized it was going to be a really powerful moment. But even so, I still was, that I think people are really going to connect to it or really even understand it because it's pretty out there. Um, yeah. And that it was meta commentary too. I think that completely, like, I think I thought like, oh, it's kind of meta, cool. And but people connected to it in a much bigger oh, way. Oh, yeah, the choice and engineering and also just, you know, being able to kind of roll back and think of all those other moments throughout the game. And so, you know, yeah. a great revelation like that. They're few and far between in games where you sort of like, then you want to play it again, you're just like, oh wow, really, that does all make sense, right? Yeah, I mean, I think as a team, we were definitely proud of what we had done, but at, up till that point, you know, SWAT 4 was the biggest game that we worked on, and we had no expectation of that anybody would pick this up, or even like Bioshock cosplay. I remember the first cosplay I saw with a guy in the Big Daddy suit, and his little daughter was in the kitchen cabinet. I think that was the first one I saw. I was like, whoa, people 
know this stuff? That's insane. Yeah, people were building these outfits, and yeah, and that's only that only expanded with with Infinite. I mean, that sort of went crazy with Infinite, yeah. with people cosplaying Elizabeth and Lutesses and Booker. It meant a lot of pe to people, and I, I I don't think that's something we ever saw coming, and we're deeply you know we're deeply grateful for it because it's one thing to make a game and get good reviews and, and stuff like that. It's another thing to have things that people are having their th weddings themed around it, uh, and their yeah. and their tattoos and naming their children after characters. You can't plan for that. And I think the only way that could happen is if you know you just make something that's something that you're deeply in love with and passionate about. We, I can say we were. It was something we were, there's a lot of passion on the team about. But we, we didn't know people were gonna take away what they did. Would you kindly? Would you kindly? Powerful phrase. Familiar phrase. Would you kindly? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly head to Ryan's office and kill the son of a bitch? Part of the challenge with that, though, is when people love fiction so much and they dive into you know every word written in every audio log and try and connect all the fiction, make sure it all makes sense. Are there any things from that game that you sort of look back and it's like, oh wow, like we didn't explain this and we should have, or things that fans have misinterpreted over the years? And there are things we think that we could that we did that should or shouldn't have been in the game. Like I, I, I was never a fan of having two endings, and the I think that's the, what the publisher was asking you to sort of have a. That right, was the right. one thing that Two K, and they were very hands off. That was the one thing they insisted on, and I, I, it's not something I really thought was a good idea because they're still limited, even though they're multiple, they're right. still limited. And so that was something that we ended up doing. One of the endings was far better than the other one. I mean, there's no, there's no, it's clear that I was much more interested in the happier ending with the little sisters than I was with the nuclear submarine ending. I think that was, ending. I'm sure yeah. part of it was the idea that, you know, if this game is, if you're making a choice throughout it, I'm sure when some people were like, oh, well then there has to, it has to be a, a payoff, right? Right, except the game was really about that lack of choice, choice. Yeah, yeah, right. not being yeah. a choice. So, exactly. so yeah. that, that always struck me as a tension that was weird. But you know, look at the end of the day, they were putting up a lot of money, and right. you know, so I, I can't really complain. They weren't dictatorial at all during the development. So yeah, that was the one thing. But I, that's a game that I wouldn't have put the boss battle in the final boss battle. Like <laughs> we, we seem to end up doing that over and over and over again. Every time we start a project, I'm like, I'm never going to do that again. We're never going to do that again, and we end up doing it. Right. We're not good at boss battles, and that you know you're fighting that guy, and look, this is yeah. the naked dude. It, it just it yeah. just doesn't work. Totally makes sense. Uh, but um, and it works really pretty well up till then, but then it it doesn't. It just doesn't yeah. work. That boss battle's silly. Yeah.